Um, just a little bit of a, a background on me. I played 20 years professionally and was very fortunate to represent my country. But that's all pretty boring stuff when you think about blokes running seven marathons in seven days. The bits where I think sort of parallel with Guernsey and the, and the lessons and, and what I've observed over time probably equates more to my upbringing. Um, my dad was born in the Congo, my mom was born in Egypt. They both moved down to South Africa at the ages of five and seven um, with our parents. Um, and we grew up in a pretty average part of Johannesburg. Um, walking to school would often be past a couple of drug dealers, a hobo here and there. You had to be careful what you wore and carried because you wouldn't probably have it by the time you got to school. Um, and you learned to be pretty street smart pretty quick. Um, I know what you guys are probably thinking at the moment is quite a long way away from St. Peter Port. Um, so when I, when I first arrived on the island, um, as you do, you get there and you try and get as much information as possible. Um, I had been to Guernsey before in the GPL, met a lot of people, um, fantastic people. The, the hospitality on the island is first class um, and the people are just overly, overly friendly. So when I spoke to a few people up front, um, the messages I got were people are soft, people are soft, life is easy, everyone's got cash, they're spoiled. You're going to have lack of numbers when it comes to your sports, so good luck scrounging teams together. Um, no one really works very hard, sport-wise that is, not commercially. Um, and what I realised, well, there weren't a lot of solutions forthcoming, a lot of problems. I thought, oh brilliant, what have I signed up for here? But as you do street smarts as a young kid, you think, well, I'll hang five, I'm, maybe I'll do a little bit of uh, digging myself before I decide to jump in. And what I did see over the first six months, well, all those things were absolutely correct. They were right. And, um, you know, I've got pretty close to my uh, RG over there, my uh, renegade Gurn, Colin Fellows. He likes to use that word soft quite a bit as well. And um, some of the other things that I did find out is this island's very, very small. Within the first couple of weeks, I was getting greeted in the streets and I was greeting people and um, I'm bad with names, so the island has to be pretty small. So your business had become everyone's business. And that'll come back to a couple of things we'll talk about sport-wise and, and the different mindsets. I like that word mindset as well. Um, I know we get a lot of athletes who put a barrier up against it, but that barrier comes from fear. They're a little bit scared about it, so they just all run away. And the other things that um, I learned very quickly in six months, and I'm sure I brought the word onto the island, but the word was no. A lot of athletes on the island never heard that word, either from a parent, from a sporting body, a coach. Everything was, what do you want, my boy? Here you go. Best of the best. Now, I know as a young kid, I never really heard the word yes. So I was on the other end of the spectrum. So this was going to be a quite a big cultural shift. Because of the numbers game, a lot of people had never been dropped. And people like to say left out, but that's just a nice diplomatic English way. I'll give you the South African Aussie way they got dropped. <laughs> they weren't good enough. But no one's actually ever done that, and they haven't experienced it. So if you've never experienced being dropped, how do you know what it's like to fight to come back? So that's pretty hard too. And if you've spoken to Jeremy and Rachel and that about the mindset bits, I would, in a very general term, I would call Guernsey very, very fixed. And when you talk about guys and saying how we need to learn and get better at making mistakes, which I'll get onto in a bit, that's where the island needs to move forward, in my opinion. And feel free to fire bullets. I'm pretty good at taking them. I grew up in Joburg. But um, when we fire bullets and we open debate, we actually come up with a few solutions. If we're all going to agree with each other, then we're going nowhere. So those are some of the things that I found early on. Players were elite on the take. They were quite happy to take what was available, so they would take your time, my time, each other's time, if they bothered to arrive at times. Finances, everyone's happy to take finances. Give me a free trip to Malaysia, no worries. Facilities, unbelievable. Unbelievable. I got onto the island, that indoor centre is, if I tell you on the county circuit, there's probably four counties with an indoor centre of that quality. 
Three bowling machines, a Merlin, which is a spin bowling machine, just costs about 12 or 15 grand. Uh, three tennis ball machines, other bowling machines. And then they opened up the coaches because I, I made a list in my ignorance. These are the things I'm going to need. <laughs> coaches come and gets open. I might as well have just put numbers down next to those. Oh, they've already got seven of those and eight of those. I only need one. Well, they've all got, oh, Jesus, okay. Well, that's pretty good. I don't know why we've got eight of those. There's only three coaches. <laughs> I suppose you have to spend your budget, otherwise they take it away, don't they? So, yeah, that was quite an eye opener. Facilities, unbelievable. Ability, we hate that word. Talent, potential. <whistles> but natural ability, ability to play, unbelievable. I've seen kids here do, in cricketing terms, what there's no way your average English kid does. No way. But we get to a point at around 15, 16, where those kids get a lot stronger and bigger. Um, they're fighting for places. They might want to become professionals. There's now in cricket in terms as a pathway. So through Sussex, you can actually become a professional cricketer from Guernsey. Wow. We had an indoor centre like that when I was young. I would have never made it. But... <laughs> <laughs> I jest, but you know what I mean. Um, so th th there are mass loads of good things, but from an ability point of view, kids do get lazy. They've got the best kit. I arrived in under 11 practice the other day, and when I got bought my first bat, I don't know if you guys, and we all know Ian, both of them obviously, but Ian scored 405 and had a big DF attack about that size. Problem was, I was about that size. So the old man budgeted for a six year plan. <laughs> so I had to try and swing this thing around. I go to an under 11 practice as a little kid, he's going to pad up, and I was there. I don't know what I was doing, but he went and pulled out two bats from a certain manufacturer, brand spanking each of them, 300 quid each. Said to his mate, which one should I use, my heavy one or my light one? I was like, do you know which side of those to hold? Mind on which one you're going to use. So culture shifts, massive culture shifts on, on what we had to deal with. But you're always, you always want to get down to the whys. You know, that is what it is. But why, why is it like that? And you've got to try and find solutions to why it is that way. And one of the simple solutions is what's always been that way. You know, if a kid's grown up yay high, and that's the indoor centre he's been taken into, and that's the bat he's had every single day, and he keeps playing, and he keeps getting picked for teams, and he keeps going abroad, why should he do anything different? But would he do something different if you took it away? And we've certainly found that does help. And we've had results doing that. And initially, like with anything, you're going to have resistance. And resistance doesn't start at the kid. Because the easiest thing the kid does, because it's a small island and all the sports are fighting for numbers, well, if I don't play cricket, I'll run to hockey. I'll go to football. I'll go somewhere else. Who cares? Forget the fact that the old man just spent two and a half grand on my cricket kid. Doesn't matter. So that's the mentality here. But once you start taking things away, and hockey does the same, and football does the same, and we all work together with sports, suddenly it gets a little bit different. I can't just go trekking around from the different sports. I might as well just... Stop playing then. Oh, that's an easy solution. This is a classic when I arrive. And what is that unbelievable providing a facility? That gym is just ridiculous. But because you've always had it, you have athletes in there. And I'm going to be a little bit careful how I say this, but the level of respect was embarrassing. The state that place used to get left in, the way people used it as a social club, I wonder what would happen if we shut those doors and took that away, what would happen? I guarantee you what would happen. Those athletes would not pay 80 quid to go to another gym, they just wouldn't train. No doubt. And that is an elite, elite facility. So the why is, the why for me was, it's always been that way. The system has always provided, and there's a big motivational gap between administrators and support staff and players. The players never have to contribute anything, but all the contribution comes from above and nothing ever gets taken away. So why should they do anything differently? So we're as much to blame as the system, we're as much to blame as the athlete. And the athletes will continue to take. But the only thing we actually ask of them is commitment and time. Now we have two guys who by their own admission, and I beg to differ, aren't athletes, can commit to doing seven marathons in seven days for fun, not, then surely to goodness, if we're going to pay to take you across to Malaysia for free, 
you can make an effort. But it doesn't work that way just yet. But things are changing, and that's the positive part of it, because there's good people at the moment on the island, there's fantastic people. And I think the most important part on those people is those people are talking together. And whether that be Steve Melbourne at rugby, whether it be Fowl, whoever it might be, there's good people talking amongst themselves. They're no longer the sport sort of in isolation and all trying to do their own little bit. Because I know we're all trying to fight for our little bit of the pie on the island because we do only have 63,000 people. But the more we work together, the better those results will be. And the more we buy into changing those mindsets, changing that fear of failure, which we're going to come to in a bit. I know we're on time when you said 8.30, you're joking. Jesus. <laughs> but as soon as, we ch as soon as we change that, that's when we're going to start changing things on the island. Um, sorry. Yeah. The, the dangerous bullet. And, the, and this isn't just a bullet, this is like a massive grenade. <laughs> the one thing I found when I got here... <laughs> The kid's biggest enemy is his parents. Okay? And that's why I say it's a grenade. So feel free to shoot me down. And I completely understand the role of the parent. You love your child, of course you do. You want to provide the best for him, of course you do. But are you? Are you? Because at the end of the day, I'm going to ask you a question. If I drop him and you come and make a loud noise, first of all, you're wasting your time. But if you come and waste come and shout at me are you going to be doing the same thing when he goes into the corporate world and he gets fired so are you teaching him the right things now by pandering or is there that element of tough love that needs to keep start coming into it so parenting is a massive thing the messages that go across are oh, you you're you're awesome you're the next thing to promise you you are i know nothing about cricket but you are so don't tell them make sure you bat first and if you're out, make sure you get another chance. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And I, I am sort of being a little bit facetious, but we've got to understand the role of the parents. And it was touched on. Don't ask them whether they won or lost. You know, you're putting an importance on that. Kids are so clever. They'll tell by the tone of your voice whether you're trying to pull the wool over their eyes. So actually show a genuine interest about what their day was like. Because at the end of the day, they're all kids, they're amateurs, and they're playing. Forget, forget about that word sport, they're playing. Do you ask them whether they won or lost when they climbed the jungle gym? No, no clearly. They're healthy at the end of it, they didn't break their arm. So why is that any different to sport? So let's just be careful about the message we pass on to younger kids. And once we change that, I'll guarantee you it'll change sport and the perception of sport on the island. Two minutes.